So um, today what I'm going to talk to you about is some of the work I have been doing during my PhD with Sergei Lebedev at the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies and specifically about this section of it which focused on trying to image the quite actually challenging task of seeing the cratonic lithosphere beneath Africa. Mm. So Africa is, as you probably are all familiar with, one of the continent on earth which has the highest, largest amount of uh, Paleoproterozoic and Archean rocks uh, on outcrop. And in particular, these are believed to be forming together the cores of few well-defined craters. So the West African, the Congo, the Tanzania, and the Kapval craters. However, once we actually have a look at the actual outcrops of uh, Archean rocks, which are the ones that define and typically are meaning that we have uh, obviously cratonic rock and a presence of a crater in this area, we can see that these are actually much smaller, as you can see on the map here, and by looking at these poly blue polygons, than what is previously proposed, leaving huge gaps in where uh, other geophysical studies, typically seismic tomography, interpret their larger extensions. So typically underneath very large basins. So what this means is that if we also compare this with um, the location of seismic stations, which lay the, uh, the, the basis for most of the geophysical studies that sample the craters in the continent, we can see that many of these question marks align fairly well with the areas where actually we have very little information and station availability in the area. In order to try to tackle the problem that is posed by the um, simultaneous lack of surface, data, uh, of surface geology data in these basins, and also the lack of seismic stations, uh, seismic tomography has trying to be approaching the problem of imaging Africa and, the Af and its craters in different ways. One traditional way to do it is by using regional scale tomographic models. And while these do achieve high resolution, they obviously, as the name suggests, do not sample the most of the areas of interest that we highlighted before. Another approach and quite diametrically uh, opposite is by using continental and global scale models. But these, while they do sample all of the features in the continent with the same resolution, they have com to compromise on the resolution, typically for the sheer computational scale of the problem. So the way we approach this as DIAS is by using uh, wave or waveform tomography with big data. And what this means is that we use millions of seismograms, both re global and regional, and they are then fed into an efficient inversion scheme that is capable of handling this large data set. And the advantages this brings is that the global and long paths provide an even coverage along the area, which is extremely important in Africa, as we have seen that the distribution of seismic stations is highly uneven, and contribute with low frequencies that constrain remote areas and the large scale and deepest structure. While on the other hand, the um, regional short paths provide a high frequency detail that really brings up this additional crispiness in the lithosphere and crust that is key for interpreting the fine scale distribution of the anomalies in the continent. Now, what this means in practical uh, is that at Dias we collected a data set of over 6,000 stations and 27,000 events that combined leads us to have over 1.2 million waveform fits that sample our final model. And this, this means is that we have an over 7,000 data points at minimum that sample each point of our model in the African region, as you can see by this map. So the way we try to handle this big amount of data, and I'm trying to be brief in this, is that uh, we have a fully automated procedure which is capable of breaking down this, the whole inversion process into three steps. So at first, the seismograms are fed into the automated multiple inversion, which is completely automatic and for each path computes synthetic seismograms and fits the S, multiple S and surface wave phases to the observed one to derive, so for each single uh, source station path, the a set of linear equations for the variation of VP and VS. Then what we do is then we can combine all these independently derived equations into a large linear system and solve it in three dimensions directly for the distribution of VS, VP and VS azimuthal anisotropy, producing global models that are typically optimized in terms of regularization parameterization for the area of interest. But the final step, which is a bit different from probably what uh, some of you that may be familiar with tomography are used to, is the outlier rejection. And it relies on the fact that 
by the fact of using a large amount of data, we, uh, our initial preliminary model is typically polluted by noise, which is due to the station, to station timing errors and uh, event mislocations typically. And what this means is that typically it forms very high amplitude um, points where we have the mislocated station or the event. And what we do is that we use our very large data redundancy to be able to identify statistically the equations that are less mutually consistent and remove them so that we eventually end up with a much cleaner and much more readily interpretable model. So I'm going to jump straight uh, into our results and try to describe a bit what we observed first. So here we are looking at S-wave velocity slices in the lithosphere. And for the ones that may be less familiar with seismic tomography, the way you have to look at it is that S-wave velocity is a proxy for temperature. In this case, um, high, faster velocities, so typically blue and uh, purple um, colors in this plot, will indicate a colder lithosphere or mantle, whereas lower velocities, reds and yellow, will indicate, will indicate uh, hotter temperatures. So what we can see already by looking at these slices is that we see a, a complexity that is already somewhat different from what we reminded from the very large four cratons we saw in our first tectonic uh, map from Bag et al. So if we compare the 110 kilometer slice directly with the outcrops of Archean shields, again from Beck's paper plotted here on the right, we start to see that, for instance, in West Africa, what was believed to be a single cratonic block does correlate much better with the presence of the actual outcrops of the Rigiba and Manlio shields, bringing evidence for the fact that there are actually two craters and not one underneath this area. Similarly, once we go to Central Africa under Congo, instead of one single block, we have a more complex pattern which correlates very well with the, the location of the Gabon Cameroon, Bomi Kibali, and Kasai shields. By going farther south, the Kalahari Craton is somewhat different from what we expect, and we can see that why it, uh, it uh, shows that it has a bit less thick lithosphere in the southeast, we can see that it actually extends underneath the Rehoboth province, whose geology was always a bit controversial from field studies. While we move back up north, we can see that we actually did image two uh, completely unexposed cratons that we named the Kubango in the first case, and that we uh, kind of evidenced as the Niasa Craton uh, west, in Western Malawi. And while we go a bit up and maybe a bit closer to the focus of this whole um, seminar section, we can see that in, uh, in Tanzania, where we do have large extents of actual uh, shields on the surface, we do have only a very small cratonic lithospheric core. So what this means is that our view of the lithosphere underneath Africa and the cartonic lithosphere specifically, it's much more complex and fragmented than previously proposed. It is particularly evident once we have a look at, the, um, at, at our model compared to what was previously seen. And uh, what is interesting is that that only means that there are several independent units, but also that these units have substantially different depth extent, as you may see from the 3D rendering on the left. What is also interesting is that once we compare our cartonic lithosphere here highlighted by uh, a contour in gray to our Archean shields, again, from surface geology, we can see that while there is a very good correlation, as I have just highlighted, there are certain areas, mainly in West Africa, in Angola, in Tanzania, and in southeastern Cap Val, in which we do have Archean crust, but we do not observe a thick lithosphere underneath. So, in order to try to investigate this further, what we started to resort to is another independent data set, which is kimberlites. So kimberlites are volcanic rocks which are formed, uh, which are erupted at the base of the lithosphere and are mostly known for many, to many of you, per, um, perhaps, for the fact that the, the ones that are forming in lithosphere that is thicker than 150 kilometers, which typically implies cratonic lithosphere, do carry diamonds. So the diamondiferous kimberlites are proxies for the, present, for the presence of a thick cratonic lithosphere at the time of eruption. So what we did is we sampled the velocity anomalies underneath a global data set of kimberlites and focusing on Africa. And what we saw, to our astonishment actually, is that most of the kimberlites actually, at present day actually are on top of a non-cratonic lithosphere characterized by this 
mild blue colors, which follow the same color scale as the slices that I had shown you before. So what this implies is that the cratonic lithosphere has been eroded since the time of the Kimberlite erup uh, eruption all the way to the present day that is sampled by our tomographic image. So, but what are the possible causes of this cratonic er erosion? Of course, here there are many theories and the uh, most important ones I have summed up here. So subduction, rifting and mantle plumes. The, thanks. So the first one, subduction, we can easily rule out because the last subduction is believed to be of Pan-African age, so about 500 million years ago, while most of the Kimberlites in Africa are about 200 million years old and younger. So we can rule this safely out, leaving us only with the other two options. Looking at rifting, we started to correlate a bit the ages of the, and the approximate ages from the Kimberlites together with the rift, uh, ages of the rifting. And in the case of the Central Atlantic and the east uh, rifting of uh, South uh, East Africa, we can see that the Kimberlites are actually younger than the age of the rift, indicating that the Crichtons survived the rifting. In the South Atlantic, however, this is a bit different, and because especially Angolan Kimberlites are kind of and coeval with the opening of the Atlantic. But if we have a look at two Cratons which are just adjacent the rift ax uh, axis. So namely the Gabon Cameroon in the north and the Angola in the south, we can see how these are being, have very different thicknesses indicating that the rift itself cannot be the cause for their for destruction of only one of them. So this leaves us with the last option, which is mantle plumes. And indeed, if we start to have a look at the areas where we observe cratonic erosion, we can see that they correspond fairly well with locations of well-known large igneous provinces that have believed to be representing the impingement of mantle plumes underneath the continental lithosphere. I will start by focusing in Tanzania, and for a very simple reason, because as we all know, and we have been discussing uh, by the talk of Tyrones lately, Tanzania is actually a place where active plume, uh, uh, where uh, it's supposed we expect to see an active plume source at present day impacting the lithosphere. And indeed, our tomography shows a very strong curtain like low velocity anomaly underneath the whole East African rift system. By having a look at this, again, with the help of 3D rendering, we can see quite easily that this low velocity curtain underneath the East African rift system, it's exactly underneath the very small high velocity anomaly. And so the very small cratonic keel of the Tanzanian crater. And once we have a look at kimberlites, in this case mapped out as red dots, we can see that the kimberlites uh, in Tanzania that are 50 million years old, so this means before, the onset of the Afar plume are diamondiferous, while the most recent ones, which are approximately uh, zero million years old actually, are completely barren. And what this means is that in, during this time, there has, the, there has been a loss of the pressure temperature conditions for the diamond stability field in Tanzania, implying that the cratonic root of the Tanzanian, crate, of the Tanzanian craton thinned substantially, probably in relationship to the onset of the plume. Now, if we go to the other two case studies that I mentioned, so in Angola and South Kral, things are a bit more complicated by the fact that the plumes and the erosion is not more ongoing. So in this case, what we did is that we reconstructed the location of the two cratons highlighted here by this, um, uh, by this uh, timeline going to Atlantic. And we saw that the reconstructed location both point in both cases point towards area where there are a lot of hotspots in the South Atlantic. However, what is interesting is that we, if we actually map and have a look at the area, of, sorry, at the age at which the last kimberlites erupted in this time, we can see that the cratons were not on top of any hotspot exactly at the time of the last um, kimberlite eruption. So what this means that in these two cases, the evidence for cratonic destruction follow in time the impact of mantle plumes rather than being coeval. So I'm going to wrap it up very uh, fast. And we can say that we have observed a widespread destruction of the African lithosphere, principally over the past 200 million years. And that this lithospheric destructions follows in time the, imp the impact of mantle plumes. And especially in Angola and in the case of Capval, this can be ascribed with a two, and described with a two-step model in which cratons are first weakened 
by the mantle plumes and their onset, and then fainter thermal anomalies, such as the one we actually still map at present day underneath Kafal, can remove the weakened lithosphere uh, that is remain, remained after the uh, plume impingement. And what the bottom line of this whole talk, I think, is, is the fact that the fate of each kraton, in this sense, appears to be depending on its movement relative to mantle plumes. Thank you for your attention. Excellent job, Niruna. Thank you very much. There's time for a few questions. And while you type, I ask a question that's burning uh, inside of me. If, if it's so easy for plumes to destroy kratons, then why do we still have so many kratons sitting around? Uh, this is uh, a very good question. Are they destroyed? And, and if you extrapolate that back in time, is that are we living in an unusual or have we been experiencing an unusual time during the last 200 million years? So I think there are a few possible answers to this. And uh, one of them is that, as we have seen, especially by comparing this model to previous literature, um, a lot of what we think is the extent of many cratons, especially in these less covered areas, as it can be for instance, is also the case of uh, the Siberian craton uh, in uh, Eastern Russia, it's all, these are typically dictated also by the smoothness of tomographic models. So that I expected with the, improve, the further improvement in general of um, tomographic uh, imaging, we will actually discover that there is more fragmentation than what we believe. In addition to this, uh, as I said, one, one of the key points is, I think, if you want to say maybe the luck that each craton has, it's in sense because if we have seen that in the case of uh, Tanzania, we seem to observe a uh, destruction which is directly uh, related also in time with the onset of the plume. In Angola and in Capval, this appears to be uh, a two-step model. So you need not only one condition, which is the uh, onset, the, the first uh, approach of a plume directly underneath the craton, but also you need some kind of fainter, but maybe more sustaining time anomaly that follows that is able to uh, remove the lithosphere. So in, when we start to think about both of them together, this probably starts to be uh, a bit more difficult to find because uh, if we talk in the South Atlantic in particular, together with the Pas Southern Pacific, it's one of the regions of Earth where we have the most, the largest number of blue. So in this case, it may be that Africa has been, let's say, less fortunate compared to other continents such as North America. Okay, thank you.